students, welcome to the lecture on waste treatment and disposal. And after this lecture, we will be able to learn the following objectives. Understand treatment of water. Discuss about treatment of solids. Describe the treatment of air emissions. Explain the surface disposal. Let's start with the concept of waste treatment and disposal. During drilling and production activities, many wastes are generated that must be treated. The purpose of waste treatment is to lower the potential hazards associated with a waste by reducing its toxicity, minimizing its volume and or altering its state so that it is suitable for a particular disposal option. For many wastes, Treatment is required prior to final disposal. A variety of treatment methods are available for most wastes, but not all methods can be used on all waste streams. The different treatment methods vary considerably in effectiveness and cost. Most waste treatment processes involve separating a waste stream into its individual components, example, removing dissolved or suspended hydrocarbons and solids from water or removing hydrocarbons from solids. Let us now discuss the treatment of water. A number of methods are available to treat contaminated water to prepare it for reuse or disposal. The contaminates in water most commonly encountered in the petroleum industry can be grouped into two broad categories, hydrocarbons and solids. How does drinking water get to your home? Wow, uh, I'm not really sure. Probably through a series of pipes. Pipe. Pipes. Pipes. Pipes and what? Through pipes. I have no clue. I assume it comes up through the pump in the ground? Through a filter? It gets to a house with a pump. Water pump. Ah, nature. So beautiful and calm. Hey, Splash. Did you know that reservoirs like this are one of the places where we get our drinking water? Wait a minute there. You don't want to drink this stuff. I'm telling you, I've been in a lot of water, including this reservoir. You know what's in there? Fish. You know what they do, right? They... they... Oh, <clears throat> Splash. Don't even go there. You know, a lot happens to this water before we can drink it. You're telling me? Hey, I've been cleaned up a few times. New Jersey American Waters experts work round the clock, removing bacteria, viruses, micropollutants, and other harmful particles from the water you drink. They do such a good job that American Water often provides water service that is better than what the government requires. The treatment process begins here, at the pumping station. Pumps draw raw water from reservoirs, lakes, rivers, streams, wells, or underground aquifers. Water travels by pipeline from the pumping station to the treatment facility. The first step in the cleaning process removes sediment and particles from the water with the help of coagulants. Coag... coagu... what? Coagulants are chemicals that act like magnets. They cause particles in the water to stick together. These groups of particles are called flock. Huh, I didn't know I had it in me. American Water uses two common processes to separate and remove flock from water. One sinks flock to the bottom of a tank. The other method pumps air into the water and flock, causing residual particles to float to the top. The separation of water and flock is called clarification. With either method, the clarification process removes most of the flock from the water. The next step? Filtration. Whoa! Hey, watch it! Wow! Can a water droplet get a bruise? Sheesh! Ow! Wow! I just got pushed through layers of activated carbon, sand and gravel. <laughs> Please, tell me I'm clean. Yeah, sorry, Splash. You're not completely out of the water. You're filtered, but you might be infected with tiny microorganisms. Don't worry. Disinfection doesn't hurt. 
chlorine and ozone are just two of the ways we disinfect water at New Jersey American Water. I love chlorine. <laughs> it's been disinfecting water and keeping me clean for over a century. <laughs> but uh, what's ozone? Ozone is supercharged oxygen. These bubbles scrub and disinfect. Viruses, germs, and fungi don't stand a chance. <laughs> hey, hey, that tickles! Stop it already! I'm gonna wet my pants! Hey, Splash, guess what? You're finally drinking water, ready for distribution to homes and businesses. Are you sure? How do you know? New Jersey American Water certified operators and water quality specialists test and monitor water throughout the treatment process, from source to tap. In fact, we conduct thousands of tests on your drinking water. I'm certified, verified, decontaminized and feeling fine. Removal of suspended hydrocarbons. Suspensions of oil droplets in water. Emulsions can be difficult to separate because they can be stabilized by the interfacial energy between the oil droplets and the continuous water phase. A variety of methods are available to remove suspended droplets from water. These methods consist primarily of variations of gravitational separation filtration or biological degradation. Gravity separation. The first step in removal of hydrocarbons from water is normally gravity separation. Through properly selected separator tanks with skimmers, most free oil and unstable oil emulsions can be separated from the water. Gravity separation is usually the simplest and most economical way to remove large quantities of free oil from water. However, more advanced methods are normally required to separate stable emulsions. The first stage of gravity separation is to pass the water through large tanks to allow the phases to separate. These tanks are commonly called free water knockouts, wash tanks, settling tanks or gun barrels. The effectiveness of these tanks depends on the droplet size and how long the water is in the tank. Plate separators can be used to improve the separation of oil and water. These separators consist of a series of closely spaced parallel plates that allow oil droplets to adhere to the plates, coalesces and migrate along them. The closely spaced plates reduce the settling distance required to separate the oil droplets from the water separators are mechanically simple and require little maintenance, are relatively large and are not effective for very small oil droplets. Plate separators can reduce oil concentrations to 2 to 25 mg by 1 with an average of 15 mg by 1 and can remove oil droplets down to about 20 to 30 micrometers in diameter. Plate separators can have operational difficulties under some conditions. Hydrocyclones can be used to further separate oil and water. A high velocity stream is injected tangentially into the conically shaped hydrocyclones creating a vortex. The radical acceleration created in the hydrocyclone can be several orders of magnitude greater than that of gravity and forces the more dense water and forces the more dense water to the outer edge of the hydrocyclone and the less dense oil to the center. Schematic of a hydrocyclone for separating oil and water are limited to cases where the inlet pressure is sufficient to drive the flow. For low pressure operations, the fluid may need to be pumped into the hydrocyclone. A progressive cavity pump with low shear has been found to be an effective way to increase the fluid pressure without shearing the oil into smaller drop sizes. The drop size is a critical parameter in the effectiveness of hydrocyclones in separating oil from water. A related way to enhance gravity separation is through a decanting centrifuge. In this device, the produced water enters the spinning centrifuge where the oil is separated from the water because of its lower density. Heater treaters. Oil and water can also be separated by heating the mixture.
the higher temperature lowers the fluid viscosity of the mixture and alters the interfacial tension between the phases allowing the oil and water to separate faster. Gas flotation. Suspended oil droplets can also be removed from water by gas flotation. If gas bubbles are passed through an emulsion of oil and water, the oil droplets will attach to the bubbles and be carried to the top of the mixture where they can be easily removed. Air bubbles are normally pumped through the water, although the expansion of dissolved air is also used. Gas flotation is often aided by the addition of chemical coagulants. Carbon dioxide has also been used as the flotation gas. Gas flotation, however, can create foam that is difficult to break. Filtration. One way to remove oil droplets from water is to pass the water through water wet filters or membranes. These filter media use capillary pressure to trap oil and prevent it from passing out of the filter. Advanced filtration processes include cross-flow membranes such microfiltration and ultrafiltration. These oral cesses consist of a hydrophilic microfiltration membrane that passes water but not oil droplets. The shape of the filter is typically a small diameter capillary tube that the emulsion flows. Filtration, coalescence, another type of filtration is to pass the water through oil wet filters. The oil droplets attach to the filter matrix and coalesces into larger ones. When the filter medium has become saturated, larger oil droplets will flow out of the filter, either by continued injection or by washing. Chemical coagulants. The removal of small suspended oil droplets can be aided by adding chemicals that coagulate and flocculate the droplets. These chemicals typically overcome the electrostatic repulsion charges on the individual droplets, allowing them to coagulate into larger drops. These larger drops can then be more efficiently removed with gravity separation equipment. Chemicals used in include lime, alum and polyelectrotypes. The use of dithiocarbamate has also been reported. Electric field separation. Another way to separate oil from water is by applying an electric field voltage to the water to electrostatic alloy remove the oil. These fields can be applied through either a direct or an alternating current. Oil droplets in an oil in water emulsion have a negative surface charge, zeta potential that can be manipulated to facilitate their removal. When a direct current is applied to the water containing such an emulsion, the oil will migrate toward the positive electrode. Removal of dissolved hydrocarbons. In addition to suspended hydrocarbons, most produced water also contains varying amounts of dissolved hydrocarbons. A variety of methods are available to remove these dissolved hydrocarbons from the water. Absorption. An effective way to remove low levels of dissolved hydrocarbons is to absorb it onto a solid medium. The most widely used medium is activated carbon. The pH and temperature of the system impacts the effectiveness of activated carbon on removing different hydrocarbon compounds. All free oil must be removed prior to the use of activated carbon to prevent the oil from clogging the carbon. In some coal, may also be used as an absorption media. Volatilization. Volatile organic carbon compounds, VOCs, can be removed from water by lowering the partial pressure of the compound in the vapor in contact with the water. When the partial pressure of the dissolved VOCs in the water exceeds that of its vapor pressure, the compounds will come out of solution and enter the vapor phase. A variety of methods can be used to volatilize VOCs. Perhaps the most common is air stripping. In this process, air and water are passed through a containment vessel in counter-current flow where VOCs evaporate into the air. The removal of VOCs can be enhanced by heating the air or by using steam because higher temperatures increase their vapor pressure. Biological processes biological treatment can be used to remove low levels of dissolved hydrocarbons from water waste streams. 
Biological treatment consists of mixing oxygen and nutrients with the water in a tank. The bacteria then degrade the organic compounds. This process is widely used in municipal water treatment plants but may be too slow for oil field applications. Precipitation The solubility of many organic molecules decreases as the pH decreases. By lowering the pH, some organic materials can be precipitated. Precipitation, however, will not remove all dissolved hydrocarbons and will acidify the water. Ultraviolet irradiation. The use of ultraviolet radiation, including solar radiation to break down hydrocarbons, has also been studied. In this process, high energy, short wavelength photons are used to break the chemical bonds of dissolved hydrocarbons. Oxidation. Dissolved hydrocarbons can also be destroyed through oxidation. Ozone, peroxide, chlorine or permanganate has been tested. To be effective, however, oxidation normally must be conducted at high temperatures or with ultraviolet irradiation. Oxidation is not practical for most oil field applications. Removal of suspended solids during many drilling and production activities, solids will be suspended in water that must be removed prior to water disposal. These solids include cuttings generated during drilling and sand and clay particles produced during oil production. Several methods are available for removing these suspended solids from the water. Gravity separation. The simplest way to separate the larger solid particles is to use gravitational settling. Fluids can be discharged into pits or tanks where the solids settle to the bottom. Gravitational settling, however, is not effective for very small particles. The use of settling pits may also be limited by environmental regulations and the potential for future liability. Centrifuges can be used for enhanced gravitational separation. Filtration. Another way to remove suspended solids is to filter the water. The water passes through the filter while the solids are retained. The resulting filter cakes may be non-hazardous and could be disposed of like pit bottom sludge. Filtration has considerable promise for separating oil field wastes. Coagulation. An effective way to enhance the separation of suspended particles is to coagulate, flocculate the particles into larger agglomerations. The larger agglomeration can then be separated more easily by gravitational settling, centrifugation or filtration. One successful way to coagulate suspended solids is to add chemicals that overcome the electrostatic repulsive charges on the solids to allow them to flocculate. Chemicals that can be used include calcium chloride, ferric chloride or aluminium potassium sulfate. A high molecular weight polyacrylamide polymer has been found to be effective to flocculate solids in water-based drilling muds. A non-ionic polyethylene oxide with a high molecular weight non-ionic polyacrylamide polymer has been found to be effective oil-based muds. Removal of dissolved solids. Most wastewater has also contains dissolved solids particularly salt, hardness, ions, calcium and magnesium, and heavy metals. A variety of methods are available to treat these waters. The methods vary considerably in cost and effectiveness. Iron exchange. Iron exchange water softening is an effective way to remove hardness ions from water. In most cases, the hardness ions calcium and magnesium are replaced with sodium ions. The removal of hardness ions is necessary for many processes because these ions readily precipitate and form a hard scale that can foul equipment. There are two major ion exchange resins, substrates, that are commonly used. Strong acid resins using sulfonic acid and weak acid resins using carboxylic acid Strong acid resins can be regenerated simply by flushing with a concentrated solution of sodium chloride. Weak acid resins, however, must be regenerated by flushing with a strong acid-like hydrochloric 
or sulfuric and then neutralizing with sodium hydroxide. Precipitation. Many dissolved solids precipitate from water to form scale as the temperature, pressure and or chemistry changes. The most widely used system for precipitation is to add lime or sodium hydroxide to increase the pH of the water. At high pH, dissolved solids including heavy metals tend to precipitate as hydroxide sludge. Lime plus sodium carbonate has also been used to enhance the precipitation of calcium carbonate. The pH at which many metal hydroxides will precipitate is shown in table. The most common way to totally remove all dissolved solids from water is through filtration processes like reserve osmosis. These processes, however, are not intended to be used for wastewater treatment but to provide potable water from no potable water. Evaporation, distillation, on another way to obtain potable water from water containing impurities is to evaporate and condense the water. Like reserve osmosis, this process is primarily used to provide a stream of pure water not to treat a stream of wastewater. Like reserve osmosis, this process concentrates the wastes which results in a smaller waste volume that ultimately must be disposed. This process is also very expensive. Biological processes. Although biological processes cannot destroy dissolved solids, they can alter their chemical form. For example, biological processes can alter the availability of heavy metals for uptake by plants as well as the ability of metals to leach through the soil. Bacterial remediation has also been successfully used to remove sulfides from produced water. Now moving on to the next topic, we will study the treatment of solids. During drilling and production activities, a substantial volume of contaminated cuttings, soil and produced solids are generated. The most common treatment method is to separate the solids from any contamination, contaminating water or hydrocarbons. Varieties of treatment methods are available to clean contaminated solids and are reviewed below. The effectiveness of different treatment methods depends on the solid type and size as well as the initial contamination level and targeted final contamination level. Pre-processing techniques including materials handling can also impact the effectiveness of a treatment method. Preliminary tests of a particular method on a representative sample are recommended. Removal of water. A variety of methods are available to remove water from solids including evaporation and filtration. One of the most common applications of dewatering technology is treating reserve pits containing drill, cuttings and water muds. Evaporation. The simplest way to dewater solid wastes in arid climates is to put them in open pits or on concrete pads and allow the free water to evaporate. Evaporation is a common way to remove water from reserves pits following drilling, although changes in regulations may now require a more rapid dewatering than evaporation allows. Produced water can also be disposed of by evaporation as long as the volumes are relatively low. In most cases, no special attempt has been made to limit leaching of metals or hydrocarbons from reserves pits or evaporation ponds. Percolation. In some arid areas where the water table is very deep, aqueous wastes can be placed in percolation ponds. These ponds have permeable sides and bottoms allowing the water to percolate into the surrounding soil, leaving the solids at the bottom of the pond. The use of these ponds is highly restricted However, because they allow dissolved solids in the water to spread into the surrounding soil. Mechanical methods. In many cases, evaporation is too slow to remove water from solid wastes. A number of mechanical methods are available to dewater solids. Preliminary separation of free liquids from the solids should be made with shale shakers, settling ponds, or hydrocyclones. To further reduce the free water content of sludges, 
more advanced expensive technologies can be used. These technologies include high pressure filter presses, centrifuges and vacuum filtering. Polymer conditioning of sludges can also be used to enhance dewatering. Washing One of the least expensive ways to remove most of the hydrocarbons from solids is to wash them. The solids can be entrained in a fluidized bed of upward flowing high velocity water. Let's know the meaning of treatment of air emissions. During drilling and production activities, a substantial volume of air pollutants can be generated and emitted. These pollutants include hydrocarbons, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides and particulates. A variety of treatment methods are available, but their effectiveness varies considerably with the pollutant being treated. Hydrocarbons the primary source of hydrocarbon emissions is from the exhaust of internal combustion engines. Unfortunately, there is little that can be done to treat these emissions other than to operate the engines within their design specifications. The vapor space in production tanks can collect volatile hydrocarbon vapors. These vapors can be collected and treated with vapor recovery systems. Casing gas from thermal enhanced oil recovery operations may also contain high levels of hydrocarbon vapors. These casing gases can be collected in a separate gathering system and treated by absorption. Sulfur oxides. Sulfur oxides are generated from the combustion of fuels containing sulfur. Although these emissions can be treated to remove the sulfur, the emission of sulfur can also be reduced or eliminated by the use of low sulfur fuel. Availability of scrubber systems is available to remove sulfur from air emissions. Nitrogen oxides. Nitrogen oxides are generated from high temperature combustion and from the combustion of fuels containing nitrogen, crude oil. Unfortunately, these emissions are difficult to treat and may require specially designed equipment. Equipment to minimize the emission of nitrogen oxide in combustion gases includes low NO burners, flue gas recalculates, selective catalytic reduction devices and selective non-catalytic systems. The amount of nitrogen oxides emitted can also be lowered by reducing the amount of oxygen in the combustion process. Surface disposal. The easiest and least expensive method of waste disposal is to discharge the wastes onto the ground or into surface waterways. Although this has historically been a common disposal method for many wastes, its use and misuse has been a major factor in the increase in environmental regulations governing the petroleum industry. Nevertheless, various forms of surface disposal are still appropriate for many treated wastes. Disposal of water. Waste water can be discharged directly into local streams, rivers or the ocean as long as its quality meets regulatory standards, that is, its concentration of suspended and dissolved solids, chemicals and hydrocarbons are sufficiently low. Surface discharge is regulated in most areas, however, and permits for such discharge are required. When waste water is discharged offshore, the water is typically treated to remove only the hydrocarbons. Although the dissolved solids, salt concentrations of most produced waters are high enough to be toxic to even marine life. The rapid mixing and dilution of the discharged water makes the resulting environmental impact negligible. For near shore discharges in shallow water, there is less opportunity for mixing and dilution of the discharged water and a toxic flume can exist for some distance away from the discharge point. Disposal of solids. Waste solids can be discharged directly onto the ground or into the ocean as long as their quality meets regulatory standards, that is the concentration of contaminants like hydrocarbons and heavy metal is sufficiently low. Because such discharges are regulated, permits are required in most areas. Offshore discharges. Offshore discharges of treated solids 
such as drill cuttings and produced solids are permitted in some areas where offshore discharges are prohibited waste solids must be transported to shore for disposal this is generally more expensive than offshore treating and discharge subsurface disposal subsurface disposal is the most widely used method for the disposal of most petroleum industry wastes liquids are usually injected into deep subsurface formations through injection wells and solids are usually buried in shallow pits at a drill site if wastes are considered hazardous under applicable regulations however disposal at a licensed hazardous waste disposal site may be required now in the end let us summarize what we have learnt in this lecture filter media use capillary pressure to trap oil and prevent it from passing out of the filter subsurface disposal is most widely used method for the disposal of most petroleum industry wastes liquids are usually injected into deep subsurface formations through injection wells and solids are usually buried in shallow pits at a drill site schematic of a hydrocyclone for separating oil and water are limited to cases where the inlet pressure is sufficient to drive the flow nitrogen oxides are generated from high temperature combustion and from the combustion of fuels containing nitrogen crude oil an effective way to remove low levels of dissolved hydrocarbons is to absorb it onto a solid medium